continue on our study of the book of Daniel. Again, our theme for the book of Daniel has been Daniel, the blueprint for the people of God in the judgment hour. As we looked again at the uh, biography of Daniel and we've seen how he uh, interacted with the nations, with the kings um, in trial and persecution. We also uh, studied and looked at um, methods by which uh, the gospel was given through the ministry of Daniel as he came in contact with people that did not know God. And when they heard the message, such as Nebuchadnezzar, it was published throughout the world and how various trials brought Daniel and his companions to the forefront for the glory of God. So as they saw his good works, they glorified their father, God, which was in heaven. And so we understand that as we look at the life of Daniel, there are so many lessons to be gleaned. We talked about his prayer and his dedication, his studying of the word of God. All of these things must characterize God's people in this final hour of earth's history. God wants to bring us in contact with the nations. Why? Because <clears throat> God would have us to bring the message to every nation, kindred, and tongue and people. God would have us to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. But too often, situations, circumstances, policies, tradition, ease, prosperity has caused us to build up barriers about us. And God is going to allow and is allowing the modern day society to tear those walls down, not for an ecumenical movement, not for the exchanging of pulpits, but for the purpose of spreading the gospel so that Jesus can come. And so as we looked at those things, we are continuing now. And for the last um, weeks, we have been looking at the prophecies of Daniel and those prophecies that God had given to be given to the world. As he relayed them to Daniel, he tells Daniel these things, uh, how Daniel would stand in his lot and these messages will be given wings, understanding, and many will run to and fro, and knowledge concerning these prophecies will increase. And we're living in that time today. And so we're praying that God would be with us again as we study his word, and we're praying that you would be blessed as well. Again, this is our midday serve, mid, our midweek service that every Wednesday we have uh, normally without the Tuesday and the Thursday, we generally come together every Wednesday evening at 730. But since we've been going through the book of Daniel, we've added the Tuesday and the Thursday evening. Now on tomorrow, we will be back here on Thursday evening at 730 because we know that many people are preparing and often use Thursday uh, in the early part of that evening for uh, Sabbath preparation and various things that people are doing. And so we don't want to tie anyone's hands um, as they're making that preparation uh, for uh, the coming of the Sabbath. And so we're not going to meet on tomorrow midday as we, would, as we did today, but tomorrow evening we are going to meet at 7.30. And so again, we pray that you would be able to be with us as we study and as we break bread together. Those of us who can at this time, we will go into a uh, season of prayer and we will allow you to pray and then we will pray and we'll close um, at the end of that prayer. So those of us who can, we'll kneel at this time and we'll seek the Lord in prayer.
Father in heaven, again, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your divine grace. Lord, truly we are living in the, at the end of time. And often our faith, our works, our profession is not in harmony with the times in which we're living. The intensity that should be seen among us as thy people is lagging. The need to stand in that peculiar place that you would have us, we have failed to do. And what we have not been able to accomplish in times of peace and prosperity, we will be forced to do under some of the most trying circumstances. Lord, it is time now to trim our lamps and to see if there truly is any oil in our vessels. To know whether or not we are of the faith. Lord, we pray that we would receive your correction we would receive your chastening. For whom you love, you chasteneth. So, Father, we pray that truly we will allow your Spirit to convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Lord, breathe upon thy people that we would see and recognize our great need. For it is high time that we arise and wake out of sleep. So bless us once again with an understanding of thy word. Teach us, Lord. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Again, tonight, today, when we were together, we were in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 10, as we were looking at that setting of that final scene of, which we're, of what we're looking at as we go through Daniel 11, and 12. We're looking at the final scenes of verse history. We're looking at Daniel's final vision and we're seeing that God is setting the scene for us in chapter 10 just as God would set the scene for John in chapter 1. And so this scene of 10 is critically, is critically important for us as a people that we would understand that as we're looking at these prophecies, that as we're going through this, that the people of God, that as they are moving through these time and they're seeing these wars and rumors of wars, as they're in experiencing intense persecution, as Satan is working through these various kingdoms to silence the witness of Jesus, to uh, um, separate the people of God from God, that they cannot be lights in the world. We read and we studied the other week where it was Satan's purpose to destroy the influence of Daniel because he feared that he would lose his influence and his hold over the Medo-Persian Empire. And so he had concocted a conspiracy among those presidents to move Daniel out of the way. And so as they search through Daniel's private life, as they search through Daniel's accounts, as they went through his social media account, as they went through his handling and his dealings, 
at work. They could find no fault with him because Daniel's life was hid with Christ in God. Christ, as it were, declared his righteousness for sins that were past. Daniel, he could be just and yet the justifier of Daniel. And we saw that, 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 that as Satan worked through these powers, Daniel, by the power of God, remained faithful. And so as Daniel is passing through this scene, as Daniel moves into retirement, as he steps away from active court life, the scene of chapter 10 is set. Daniel is worried about the people of God. He sees the enemy attacking, but he doesn't understand entirely what is going on until God reveals himself and shows Daniel that the prince of Persia, Satan, has been working behind the scenes to counteract and to obstruct the building of the temple to, for the prophecy to go forth for the return, for the, for the coming of the Messiah. And he's frustrating matters. And Daniel, as he's fasting, as he's praying, as he's wrestling with God, as he's waiting, God comes and shows Daniel what is about to take place. And Daniel, as we saw, had to be strengthened by God to be able to hear the vision, to be able to take in what God was about to reveal to Daniel as it related not only to the people of God, but to those nations that would come in contact with the people of God and how God's people ought to behave themselves. And so as Daniel begins to view, he listens to this prophecy. Now, I want us to understand something. I want us to fast forward and I want us to go to Daniel chapter 12. I want us to go to Daniel chapter 12 and I want us to notice something here and we're going to cover this in our study, but I want you to notice something in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel, the 12th chapter. And I want you to notice what Daniel says as it comes to Daniel chapter 12. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12, <clears throat> beginning in verse, hmm, I'll start in verse four. I want to jump over to verse Eight, and we'll look at it, but notice what it says in verse four. It says, as Daniel was hearing these prophecies, then it gets to verse four and he says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And then when you jump over to verse eight, it says, and I heard, but I what? understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. And then he jumps down and he says in verse 13, But thou, but go thy way till the end be. Thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Go with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We quoted it, but we'll, we'll read it. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 9, starting in verse 9, reading down to verse 12. 1 Peter 1, 9, reading down to verse 12. Notice what your Bible says. It says, receiving, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation, watch this, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things 
which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Jesus says many prophets have desired to see the things which we see and have not seen them to hear the things which we hear and have not heard them. They wanted to see the times in which we're living. If they could be here standing for Jesus, hearing and seeing the unfolding of truth, what would their zeal for the coming of Jesus be like? What energy would they exemplify if they could see and hear the things in which we hear and yet they have not been able to hear. In other words, they heard it. It was revealed to them, but they didn't understand it. Many of us today understand these things and yet it invokes no greater zeal than had we not heard. And this is why brothers and sisters, we have to come daily to the throne of grace, daily placing ourselves before the feet of Jesus asking him, Lord, please awaken me from this lethargy, waken me from this, this death like stupor that has come upon me that I'm more concerned with what's happening in the world than I am with preparing and preparing others for the second coming of Jesus. Please dear Lord, help me to, to be awakened from this fog, that Satan is bringing over my mind where it just becomes a very mundane thing to just go to church every week. Even now we have pivoted and now every week, every day almost, we're just sitting in front of the computer. Ask God to awaken us that we might be shaken from this stupor as we pray that God would give us the zeal and the power that we need to do his work. And you know, we're going back in our Bibles to the book of Daniel. We're going back in our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Can I see that hymnal there, Leah? Grab me one of those hymnals for a moment. We're going to the book of Daniel. Uh, there's a song here. Thank you. There's a song here, brothers and sisters. You're going back to Daniel chapter 10 as we move into chapter 11. There's a song here uh, and I want to see if I can. Yes, it's, it's song 264, song 264. Maybe I'll have my wife sing this for us on tomorrow evening. Oh, for that flame of living fire. This is what the song says. It says, Oh, for that flame of living fire, which shone so bright in saints of old, which bade their souls to heaven aspire, calm in distress, in danger bold. Where, verse two is what I want to focus on. Where is that spirit, Lord, which dwelt in Abram's breast and sealed him thine? which made Paul's heart with sorrow melt and glowed with energy and glowed with energy divine. And then it says, Hmm. Hmm. Yes. And then it says in verse, in verse four, is not thy grace, is not thy grace as mighty now as when Elijah felt its power? When glory beamed from Moses' brow, or Job endured that trying hour. Oh, for that flame, brothers and sisters of living fire. This is what we must pray and ask God for. That's in him 264. Even if you have to read that hymn and let that be your prayer, Lord, oh, for that flame of living fire. We need that flame, brothers and sisters, once again in the days in which we're living. We're in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. And 
in this prophetic line of prophecy, we have seen how Daniel 2, when God showed the great image to Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel came and interpreted the vision. And when Daniel came and interpreted the dream and he saw the head of gold represented Babylon, breast, the, the, the breast and arms of silver was Medo-Persia and the, the, the belly and thigh of brass and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. And then there was the stone. Not much, not much else was said concerning that image. But then we go over to chapter seven and then there is an expansion of that image. God shows Daniel these four beasts, these four great beasts. And the first was a lion that had eagle's wings. And we saw that that lion represented Babylon. Same line that was given to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2. God gives the same line to Daniel in chapter 7. But there is an expansion of that, of that, of that vision. He expands it. He magnifies it more for Daniel to look into. And then three years later, two years later, he gives him another vision. And in this particular vision, he sees not Babylon, but he sees Medo-Persia. Babylon has been eliminated from the timeline. Why? Because Babylon was about to fall. And so Babylon was not even considered in this vision, but it is the same line, but he starts not at the first beast, but at the second. And the second beast was the ram, which symbolized the Medo-Persian empire. And then we see the, the goat, which represented Greece. Then we saw the little horn that represented pagan Rome, papal Rome. And then we saw that God gave a prophecy, a time prophecy, that related to the people of God, that 2300 year prophecy. Then we saw in chapter nine that God gave another time prophecy that was connected to the prophecy of chapter eight. In that time prophecy, he revealed that it was 70 weeks that would be allotted or cut off for the Jewish nation. It showed the time when they would find the Messiah, that promised one that was promised to Adam and Eve in the garden, the one that was to bruise the serpent's head. They saw him in this prophetic imagery, in this prophecy of Daniel chapter nine, they saw Jesus. Daniel saw Christ. He saw the time when they would finally see the Messiah. It was Jesus. They found him. And that 70 week prophecy was allotted for the people of God. Then we find that now as we move to chapter 10, God is still dealing with that Medo-Persian empire because they have not yet fallen off the scene. It has only been, hmm, it has only been five years since they've come on the scene. Two years, Darius the Mede first took the throne when Babylon fell in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 31. He, he reigned for two years. Then he died. Cyrus took the throne and in his first year brought an end to the 70 year prophecy spoken of by, spoken of by Jeremiah in chapter 25 and in chapter 29. Cyrus in his first year gives the decree for the people of God to go back, tells them they could go back and build. And then we find, as we said, the book of Ezra comes into play. The book of Esther comes into play. Haggai, Zechariah, Nehemiah, those books come now into play because all of those books, <clears throat> Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, Haggai, Zechariah, that's all during the time of the Medo-Persian Empire. If we wanted the order, Ezra would be first, and then it would be Haggai and Zechariah, then the book of Esther, then the book of Nehemiah. That would be the order under the Medo-Persian Empire. 
And so God sets this line. He connects these various prophets and prophecies to ages, to ages to come. So now we want to look at something here. We want to look at Daniel chapter 10, Daniel the 10th chapter. And I want us you to notice something here. And Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel tells Daniel something that sets the stage as he moves into this prophetic imagery. The Bible says in the book of Daniel chapter 10, looking at verse 12, verse 12 and 13, and then we're going to jump over and look at verse 20 and 21 going into chapter 11. Notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says, Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and, 21, one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. So as Gabriel comes to speak to Daniel, he says that, that, that Daniel's prayer was heard, but for 21 days I have been battling Satan not so that he would not frustrate the work of God in the earth. And so as he prevail, as he was contending, Michael came. And when Michael came, he prevailed. Now it's interesting when we look at this Michael character, Michael means one who is like God or who is like God. This is what Michael means. It says, Michael, your prince. Let's see this. Let's follow this throughout the scriptures. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Jude. Go with me there to the book of Jude. Jude. Jude is only one book is right before Revelation. Notice what it says in the book of Jude. And we want to look at verse nine. Jude nine. And notice what the Bible says. Notice what it says, Jude 9, here, Michael. We see this Michael person in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 7. The Bible says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon prevailed not. Neither was his place found any more in heaven. He was cast out, the Bible tells us. So there was war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. The Bible is telling us that there was war in heaven. Satan was cast out. So here, but who is this Michael? Notice what it says in Jude 9. The Bible says, yet Michael, the what? Ark angel. When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. In other words, Satan was disputing. Satan was claiming the body of Moses. Why? Because Satan believed that everyone who went down into the grave, they died because of sin. Romans 6, 23, write it down. For the wages of sin is death. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, mm, Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 2 and verse verse. 14, where it says, Christ came to destroy him that had the power of death, came to destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So Satan believed that everyone that went into the grave went in because of sin. Satan being the father of lies, sin, brothers and sisters, the Bible says reigned, it has a kingdom. Therefore, it has a king. It's reigning. It's a power. Satan is or has what he believed power over the grave. And anyone that went into it, he believed that they were his lawful captives. So when Jesus came, so when Michael, when Michael the archangel came for Moses, 
That's why Satan, the devil, disputed, saying, no, he belongs to me. But the Bible says here in Jude 9, I see your hand, Leah. In Jude 9, it says, but Michael does not bring against him a regular accusation, but said what? The Lord rebuke thee. There was no arguing. The Lord rebuke thee. There's nothing to talk about. The Lord rebuke thee. Now notice. So it says, Michael, the archangel. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Yes, Leah. That was Hebrews 1. That was Hebrews 2 that I quoted from Hebrews 2 and verse 14, I believe it was. All right. We're going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 16. Remember, Michael the archangel. Daniel says, Michael, or Gabriel says in the book of Daniel, Michael, your prince. Notice what it says. <clears throat> Jude says, Michael the archangel angel. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the what? voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So at whose voice shall the dead raise? The voice of the archangel. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. At whose voice? The voice of the archangel. Well, who is the archangel? Michael, the chief. All right, notice what it says in John, 20, John 5. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. John, chapter 5. Notice what the Bible tells us in John chapter 5, <clears throat> beginning at verse 25. John chapter 5, verse 25, and verse 28. John chapter 5, 25, 28, and 29. John the fifth chapter, verse 25, 28, and 29. Notice what the Bible says. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead, when the dead shall hear the voice of the what? The Son of God. And they that hear shall live. Verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. Wait a minute. Hear whose voice? The Son of God. Wait a minute. I thought Paul says the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Michael, brothers and sisters, is the Son of God. Michael, who is like God? Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus. Yes, that I just quoted. That's John 5, 25, 28, and 29. All right. And so he says, <clears throat> Michael, the son of God, is going to, the dead will hear the voice of Michael, the archangel, the son of God, who is like God. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Look at there. Look there with me. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind, 5, be in 1 Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, watch this, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. John 10, 30 to 33. When the Jews wanted to stone Christ, he said, uh, uh, what do you stone me for? 
They said, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. When Jesus says, I and my Father are one, they understood that Jesus was saying he was God. John 8, verse 58, Jesus says when he was talking with the Pharisees, and they said, man, you're not even 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? He said, before Abraham, watch this, was I am. Not before Abraham was, I was, but before Abraham was, I am. And the Bible says they took up stones again to stone him. Why? Jesus called himself the I am, the Jehovah of the Old Testament. So here we have Michael, here we have the archangel, here we have the Son of God calling for the dead. Not two separate people, but one person. Michael, your prince. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 5. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 5. Notice what it says here, brothers and sisters. In Acts chapter 5, Acts the fifth chapter, and notice what it says in verse 30 and 31. Acts chapter 5, 30 and 31. Your Bible says, The God of our fathers raised up who? Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him have God exalted with his right hand, watch this, to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. God had exalted Jesus to be a what? Prince and a savior. Jesus takes the place from which Adam fell. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of of the world. So Jesus is God, the Father. He's not the Father, but you have God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is the Godhead. And so Jesus is becomes the second Adam. He takes the place from whence Adam fell, and he becomes the Prince of the world. Satan believes he was the prince of the world. This is why the Bible calls him the prince and power of the air. He believed that he gained rulership over the world when he caused Adam to fall. But Adam was never so ruler of the world. Jesus becomes man, takes on humanity, and becomes our savior, and steps in and becomes our everlasting father. And now through conversion, we don't claim Adam as our father, but we claim Jesus as our father, as the head of the human race. And he then beckons us to pray to God our father, to trust and allow the Holy Ghost, third person of the Godhead, to work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So when we see in the book of Daniel, we see Michael. We don't just see an ordinary individual. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. And this is why Satan was not able to prevail because Michael came and showed up. Notice what it says in the book of Daniel. Going back to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. Go back there with me, brothers and sisters. Daniel, the 10th chapter. And so the Bible says, Daniel 10, so he says, Michael, one of the chief priests came and helped me. And then we jump over. And it says, in verse 19, he says, oh, he says, and said, oh man. Verse 19 of Daniel 10, oh man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken, unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for thou hast strengthened me. Verse 20, then said he, knowest thou wherefore I am come to thee and now I will, and now I will return and fight with the prince of Persia. 
And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come, or the prince of Greece. In other words, God is telling Daniel here, he says, listen, Medo-Persia is reigning because of my power. We read something this morning, and I want us to read it again. Pull this one up for us, Leah. All right, you got it? Yeah. All right, it says, in the history of nations, the student of God's word may behold the literal fulfillment of divine prophecy. Babylon, shattered, broken at last, passed away because in prosperity its rulers had regarded themselves as independent of God and had, ascri and had ascribed the glory of their kingdom, the human achievements. The Medo-Persian power is what we're talking about now. The Medo-Persian realm was visited by the wrath of God, by the wrath of heaven, because in it, God's law had been trampled underfoot. The fear of the Lord had found no place in the hearts of the vast majority of the people. Watch this, the power exercised by how many rulers? Every ruler on the earth is heaven imparted. I want you to let that sink in. The power exercised by every ruler on earth is heaven imparted. This is why brothers and sisters, I often say, come back to me, Leah. This is why I often say, this is why I often say that I don't believe that the men that we're looking at and the women we're looking at are in control. God rules in the kingdom of men and he giveth it to whomsoever he wills. Now watch this. Go back to this. Go back to this, Leah. You, you got it? It says, in the word of God only is this clearly set forth. Here it, here it is shown that the strength of nations as of individuals is not found in the opportunities or facilities that appear to make them invincible. It is not found in their boasted greatness. It is measured, watch this, it is measured by the fidelity with which they fulfill God's purpose. All of these powers that we're seeing, everything that we see, God is in control. And oftentimes, brothers and sisters, God allows individuals to come to power, base individuals to bring their hellish plans. Why? To arouse and waken the people of God from their lethargy. If entreaties from the ministers fail, if the ministers fail to give a certain sound, then God will allow, he will allow adversity to come from the heathens to be a scourge to persecute and to rebuke and wake the people of God up. And this is what we're seeing. But I don't believe it's waking us up as, 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 as God would have it. We're focusing on it, but it's not waking us up, brothers and sisters. I mean, I'm talking about waking us up, brothers and sisters. It's not getting us up in the morning. It's not getting us on our knees. It's not getting us in the word of God as it should. It's not causing us to say, Lord, where is that flame of living fire, which burns so bright in days of old? And as it, is it moving us to manifesting the attributes of grace, that God would have us to manifest, or are we becoming cumberers of the ground, preaching to the choir? God would have us to, to reach out to those who are open for truth, who are longing for guidance. And so here, Daniel is being told, he said, listen, when I leave, the prince of Grecia shall come. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, in Revelation, notice what it says in Revelation chapter seven. Go with me there. Revelation, the seventh chapter. And I want us to notice something here. Revelation chapter seven. Revelation chapter seven. The Bible tells us 
In the book of Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Now what's interesting, brothers and sisters, you and I saw when we looked in the book of Daniel that the four winds strove upon the great sea in Daniel 7. And when those four winds strove upon the great sea, the Bible tells us that nations began to rise one after another. They were ferocious in nature and they, they, they were, mm, they were, uh, um, uh, uh, severe in their dealings with God's people. They were severe in their dealings with God's people. And so the Bible shows us that when these winds start blowing, nations start rising and falling. And so here in Revelation, notice what we see. The Bible says, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the what? Four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw an angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God, cried, cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until, till, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. God says, I'm holding things for what purpose? For my people to be in position so that God can breathe his spirit upon them. God is holding these things. So the Bible lets us know that God, that the angel said, listen, I'm fighting with the Prince of Persia. I'm fighting for the purpose of holding the winds in check so that things do not happen out of the ordinary so that God's people have time to build and be prepared for the storm. We are told brothers and sisters that a storm is coming in Matthew seven. It's going to be relentless in his fury. But those who are building upon the rock, God says, those that build upon the rock, I will liken him to a wise man who hear the words and they do them. I will liken him to a wise man who was building his house upon the rock. The rains will descend, the floods will come, the storm will beat, but the house shall not fall. But I will liken him to a fool who is building his house upon the rock. It says the storms are going to come. It says the flood will come, the rains will come, the winds will beat, and that house will fall. Why? Because they're hearing, but they're not doing. The storm is the same. There was no difference in the storm that blew upon the home that was being built upon the sand, no more different than the one that was building upon the rock. But all the difference was those that were building on the rock are those that were hearing the word and they were obeying. They weren't just, just constantly hearing the same thing over and over again. Yes, I know I should have been doing this last week. Yes, I know I should have been doing this. Oh God, thank you for your mercy. I know I'm not what I should be, but oh boy, I thank God I'm not what I used to be. No, those are people building upon the sand. They're hearing, but they're not obeying. But a storm is coming. And this is what, this is what Gabriel was saying. He said, listen, I'm going to stand with him. He said, but once they the cup of iniquity is full. I'm leaving. And when I'm leaving, I don't care how big his army is. I don't care what type of battlements he has. <clears throat> I don't care what type of generals he has. There's nothing they will be able to do to withstand what is about to happen. When I go, it falls. The Bible tells us by Christ, all things consist. All things are held together. <clears throat> And this has to be a warning to this nation. We can stand up and say, God bless America all day we want. We could, we can, we can, we can put our hand over our chest. We can salute our flag. It means nothing brothers and sisters, because once God takes his flight, I don't care how big our army is. I don't care how much, how great we want America to be. It will not stand brothers and sisters. I don't care how many people we have praying in the White House. I don't care how many people we have praying on the, con on the Senate floor. If we do not fulfill God's purpose, God's hand is going to be removed and we are going to become a byword to the rest of the nations. And God shows us this is going to happen. <clears throat> God has given us a message, brothers and sisters, that must go to the end of the world. The world must hear the message, break off thy sins, 
by righteousness, by showing mercy to the poor. God has girded thee, though you did not realize it. God has given this nation time. He has given them time, and God has given you and I time. But when Michael leaves, oh, brothers and sisters, when the angels take their flight, and brothers and sisters, there's going to be a strife like we have never known before. Notice, going back to Daniel. <clears throat> going back to Daniel 10. He says, but lo, when I'm going forth, he says, hey, Greece is coming. When I'm leaving, Greece is coming. <clears throat> but he says, Daniel, I need you to understand something. It's going to happen fast, but I need you to understand. Because you can imagine <clears throat> that God, that Daniel hears that, hey, I'm going to go back. When I leave you, I'm going back. I'm going, I'm going back to the White House. I'm going back to Parliament. <clears throat> I'm going back uh, uh, to the Prime Minister's home. I'm going back there, and I'm going to sit there, and they will continue to be given opportunities. He says, but when I leave, Greece is coming. So you can imagine Daniel, when he heard that, Daniel probably thought, like, wow, it, how long is he going to be there? But I want you to notice verse 21 of Daniel 10. He says, but I will show thee what is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Chapter 11, verse 1. He says also, I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. In other words, when Darius came to the throne in, 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 in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 31, when Darius took the seat, God says, hey, I was there. I strengthened him and I confirmed his seat. It wasn't him. I, I, I guided Cyrus. I, 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 I left open the two leave gates. I allowed Cyrus to come up and capture this city. And so God says, I stood to strengthen and to confirm his place. Darius really did no great thing for the people of God. Yes, Daniel was exalted to, uh, uh, to be head over the presidents. But through his pride and self-sufficiency, Darius was allowed to write laws that put God's people in a very tight and difficult place. They put Darius, allowed laws to be written that could have destroyed the work of God. Though God had strengthened him and confirmed him in his place, though he saw Daniel's faithfulness. Notice what Darius says in, in, in chapter 6. Notice what he says in chapter 6 and verse 20. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 20. Notice what he says here. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 20. Matter of fact, before then, before then. <clears throat> Daniel. Mm, Daniel chapter 6. And let's look at... Uh, Yes, Daniel 6, let's look at verse 16, <clears throat> and then we'll look at verse 20. Daniel 6, 16 and verse 20. Watch what it says. He says, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will do what? Deliver thee. Jump over to verse 20. When he came, Darius, to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Yes, he saw Daniel's faithfulness, but his pride got the best of him. His own honor got the best of him. And because of his pride, laws were shaped that could have destroyed the influence of God's people, that could have destroyed the influence of God in this realm, but it was because of the mercy of God. And God worked in spite of Darius. 
But the God said, I strengthened him and I confirmed him. But yet it was Darius that allowed himself to cast Daniel into the lion's den. But then God put Cyrus upon the throne. And Cyrus fulfilled the will of God in allowing the people of God to be set free. And he gave his influence because the Bible says that they would not come out of Babylon empty handed. God wanted a wonderful prophecy to be fulfilled in Jeremiah chapter 16, I believe it is, where God said, it shall no longer be said, uh, uh, the Lord God liveth that brought them up out of the land of Egypt, but no, the Lord God liveth that brought them up out of the land of the north, Babylon. God wanted to use he wanted to use Cyrus and the Persian Empire to fulfill his will in the earth. But because Medo-Persia continually had gone against the will of God and in spite of them, God had to work. We see this in the days of Esther. We see this in the days of Nehemiah. We see this all throughout the book of Ezra, how God had to work in spite of these Medo-Persian kings. But when their iniquity, their cup was full, God said he would depart and Greece would come. You know, they even today, historians, they are baffled by Alexander the Great's victory over the Medo-Persian Empire. They're baffled because they were so outnumbered that they should have lost the battle. But then they, 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 they sort of, uh, uh, given the, uh, they sort of, you know, attributed his victory to his wise planning. But oh, brothers and sisters, we see in the word of God that, that, that Alexander the Great's victory was due to God allowing him to take the throne. The Bible says God ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Notice back in your Bibles, you're still in Daniel. Go back to Daniel chapter 11, Daniel the 11th chapter. Verse one, the Bible says, also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Verse two, and now <clears throat> will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia or Greece. And the mighty king shall stand up and that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And here the Bible is talking about the overthrow of the Medo-Persian Empire being conquered by Greece. Now, we looked at this. Before, I want you to go to your screen. Da the, the, in the vision, Gabriel, in the vision, Daniel is being told what the Medo-Persian realm would look like. And again, you can follow, you can see the various kings and how it relates to the work of God when you read the book of Ezra. Because as I mentioned, as the book of Daniel is ending, as Daniel is going off the scene, Ezra, <clears throat> Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah, Esther, and Nehemiah's books are now coming into play. They're now coming into play, right? So when you see the Medan Persians empire rising on the scene, Daniel gives his, you see Daniel in six, nine, 10, all the way through 12. And then you see the book of Ezra, Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah, Esther, and Nehemiah coming on the scene. And these are the kings that are outlined there. You have Darius, Cyrus, and Cyrus' son, Cambys. And then you have this false, pseudo means false, Samertes who, who tried to, uh, uh, who tried to, uh, put himself in the ruler seat. And here you find he's mentioned here in Ezra chapter six, after Ezra chapter four and verse seven, Cyrus son is Ezra chapter four, verse six, but he's killed in war. And so by time, the letters that are sent, you'll read it. 
gets back to them, this false king is ruling, but he doesn't rule long. He's only ruled six months before he is taken down and Darius becomes the ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire. And again, it is all outlined here for us in the book of Ezra as it relates to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. I want to go back. Remember, the first decree was during the time of Cyrus. Then the second decree was during the time of Darius, which is outlined there in Ezra chapter 4, verse 24 on, onward. Yes. That was a different Darius, yes. And then you have Xerxes, <clears throat> which is the as a hearers of the book of Esther. And then you have Artaxerxes, which is found in the book of Nehemiah, uh, during the time of Nehemiah, which is found from Ezra chapter 7 to chapter 10, which is the third decree to restore and build Jerusalem, which is 457 BC, which puts the prophecy of the 70 weeks into play along with the 2300 day prophecy. Now remember, we saw in Daniel chapter eight, right? These prophecies overlap each other. We go to each of them to build off the other. We saw that the ram was Medo-Persia. Remember in Daniel chapter eight, we saw the ram was the Medo-Persian empire. Then we saw the goat, which was a symbol of Greece. And then when Greece, the first king of Greece was Alexander the Great, right? Look what it says in Daniel 11. Come back there with me. Daniel chapter 11. Look what it says. All right. So this, these kings, this king would stir up the empire against the king of Greece. But eventually, Alexander the Great would defeat the Medo-Persian Empire, right? And then the Bible says, a mighty king, verse 3, a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will, verse 4. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for what? Others beside those. Go in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter eight. Daniel chapter eight. Notice what it says concerning this little, concerning this goat. We studied this, but notice what it says. Jump down to verse eight of Daniel chapter eight. Notice what it says, Daniel chapter eight. And we're looking at verse eight, Daniel eight, verse eight. And then we're going to look over to verse 21 and 22, Daniel chapter eight, verse eight. And then we're going to 21 and 22 of Daniel chapter eight. Notice what it says. It says, therefore the he goat waxed very great and he was strong. When he was strong, that great horn was broken and for it came up for notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. Look at verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Greece and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. The first part of verse 23, it says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Now hold your finger. Now we're not coming back here. Go in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, to the book of Genesis chapter 15. When the transgressors are come to the full. Notice what it says in Genesis 
chapter 15 as Abram is getting this prophecy concerning the people. Notice what it says in Genesis, the fifth, 15th chapter, Genesis chapter 15, and let's look at verse 13 down to verse 16. Genesis 15, 13, down to verse 16, when the transgressors of that kingdom are come to a full. What are transgressors? Transgression is, uh, 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 is sin, is violating and breaking God's law. When Greece comes to the point, when their iniquity and cup is full, God says that's it. Remember, God is standing on the four corners of the earth. God is holding the winds. And when God allows those winds to blow, then that nation that has refused the mercy and the, the truth of God is finally broken. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter 15, looking at verse 13 down to verse 16. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be, thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. Watch this. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God was talking about the Canaanites, the inhabitants of Canaan land. Their iniquity, their cup of iniquity was not yet full. God tells us what their iniquity was in Leviticus, the 18th chapter. Their iniquity was not yet full. So here, God was saying, back in Daniel chapter 11, as it relates to the Grecian Empire, he says that when they, we read in, Dan, we read in chapter 8, that when they come to a full, another king will stand up. So here it says, when, 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 when uh, Greece stood up, guess what? Medo-Persia failed. But after Greece fulfills its purpose, another king will stand up and Greece will fall. So here we have in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 3 again, down to verse 4. It says, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Verse 4, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and he shall and and shall and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven like we read in chapter 8 and not to his posterity in other words it's not going to go to his children although alexander the great had children though he had a line brothers that probably could have taken the throne but eventually history tells us that they were all put to death Jealousy set in and no one honored the wishes of the king and his posterity was put to death and it was left to the strongest was able to take the kingdom. And notice what it says. It was divided to the four winds, but not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up. In other words, it's going to be divided, broken up, even for others besides those. Notice your screen. So this is what we see. It was Greece, the first king, Alexander the Great, and there were four horns, four kings shall stand in his place. And here we have the four generals. In other words, it was more, but this is what it eventually came to. It was Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, which, and Ptolemy, it says Ptolemy, but the P is silent, don't know why it's there, but nonetheless, Ptolemy took Egypt. 
And this is the battleground. This is the scene for the next few verses that we would read in <clears throat> the book of Daniel chapter 11. So now what is Daniel 11 doing? Daniel 11 is, is highlighting what these four generals would do. When you look at the book of Daniel, when you look at Daniel chapter 11, it is going to be divided up between those great empires that was spoken of in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8. Daniel 11 now, God takes Daniel and he walks him a little closer. Daniel's vision has to adjust. It's almost like if you're standing back from something, you can see. But all of a sudden you get a little closer where your eyes has to adjust. And you get a little closer and he gets a little closer. And now Daniel gets close and he literally, God allows him to peer in and see what is actually happening in these nations. So that as a people, when we're looking back, we can see where we are in the procession of ages. And this is the setting for what you and I are going to look at for the rest of Daniel chapter 11. It is going to start from the division of Greece and we're going to begin to see this epic battle between what the Bible calls the king of the north and the king of the south. King of the north and the king of the south. Because we are going to find out that just before probation closes, there's going to be a king of the north. That king of the north is going to be that last epic battle here upon the earth and God's people will find themselves caught in the middle of this battle between Michael, Christ and heaven and between Satan and his earthly host battling against us, but fighting against God. And this was the scene in brothers and sisters in which we're going to look at as we continue to walk through the book of Daniel chapter 11. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to be intelligent as to the faith that has been once been delivered to the saints. As we understand these principles, God is showing why we cannot align ourselves with these powers of the earth because they are arrayed for the strategic purpose of warring against the people of God. No matter how good their cause may seem, there is a more sinister purpose that is, that is peering through the darkness that is looking to ensnare the people of God. And we have to take our stand under the banner of Prince Emmanuel. Though the world sees us as non-essential, we must not try to find uh, 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 an essential cause anywhere else in the world only with the banner of Prince Emmanuel, but we have to fall upon the rock. It's time for us brothers and sisters to, to take our stand upon the platform of truth. We are in a battle and where will we fare? Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. Lord, as we continue to look through the books of Daniel, as we seek to understand where we are, as it relates to the end of time, help us to be found faithful. That grace, which we know is mighty now, as when Elijah felt thy power. Lord, we pray that you would breathe upon us. Lord, help us to be inspired, to move by faith, and to stand fast in the place where you have put us. We pray that you would guide us and keep us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.